Good morning for uh, our visitors and guests and uh, members of USERF and commissioners. And to our dear friend and colleague from across the pond, good afternoon and welcome uh, for a, an attending the US Commission on International Religious Freedoms hearing on online hate speech and disinformation. I am Gail Manchin, serving as chair of USERF, and I would like to personally thank, and on behalf of, of the commissioners and USERF, our distinguished witnesses for joining us today to offer their expertise and also recommendations. The US Commission on International Religious Freedom, or USERF, is an independent bipartisan US government commission created by the 1998 International Religious Freedom Act, or IRFA. The commission monitors the universal right uh, to freedom of religion or belief abroad uh, using international standards um, as, their, uh, as, our, as our policy. And we make our policy recommendations to Congress, the president, and the Secretary of State. Today, USERF uses its statutory authority under IRFA to convene this virtual hearing. During the past two decades, Facebook, Twitter, and other social media platforms have emerged as an invaluable tool for connecting people around the world. However, we all now know how social media sites can be easily used to amplify hate speech and disinformation about religious communities and mobilize real world violence, discrimination and hatred. Vile rumors or conspiracy theories that might previously spread through a village or town can now be shared online and make it around the world before being debunked. The algorithms that power platforms like Facebook and Twitter reward extremist dis discourse by incentivizing users to, to post provocative content that will receive attention through likes and reshares. There is no definition under international human rights law of the colloquial terms hate speech or disinformation. But hate speech is typically understood to mean speech that prejudices a, a specific group. International human rights standards require states to prohibit the most severe forms of hate speech specifically any advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence. This information, sometimes referred to as fake news or propaganda, means false, inaccurate, or misleading information intended to cause harm. Disinformation and hate speech are interrelated and can overlap. To use an analogy, hate speech loads the gun, but disinformation pulls the trigger that transforms digital hate into real world violence. Social media companies ban certain types of hate speech and disinformation from their platforms. Twitter's hateful content policy, for instance, bans the promotion of violence, threats, and harassment against people in religious groups and the dehumanization dehuman, of people based on their religion. Facebook similarly prohibits attacks based on religious affiliation in its community standards 
defining attacks as violent or dehumanizing speech, harmful stereotypes, statements of inferiority, or calls for exclusion or segregation. In a welcomed move last week, Facebook announced that it would ban as hate speech content that denies or distorts the Holocaust. This policy change was in response to the global increase in anti-Semitic incidents. Twitter and Facebook also ban, flag, or counter certain types of disinformation, but neither have blanket policies against misleading information on their platforms. Despite these policies, the volume of hate and disinformation being shared online is astonishing. Facebook, for instance, removes, removes three million pieces of hate speech a month, which means more than 4,000 an hour. Today, we will explore the complex role that social media has played in fomenting conflict as well as hate, violence, and discrimination toward religious communities. We will consider how the United States government and social media companies can better contribute to combating the digital spread of disinformation and hate speech. I now turn to my colleague, Vice Chair Tony Perkins, to further discuss content moderation and highlight some context of great concern to you, sir. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much, Chair Manchin. Uh, I would like to join uh, in welcoming all of you to today's hearing. You know, to enforce community standards that Chair Manchin outlined, social media companies rely on a combination of artificial intelligence, or what we call AI, and human analysts to wade through content to identify and remove insightful statements or disinformation prohibited by community standards. Notably, disinformation is not always removed, but instead may be downgraded or corrected, even as we wrestle with establishing a clear objective definition, as Chair Manchin made reference to, there is recognition that identifying hate speech involves a great deal of nuance, context, and linguistic uh, expertise, relying on machines to recognize it remains a challenge. Social media companies have also struggled with having enough content moderators who speak local dialects and have the expertise needed to proactively identify hate speech around the globe. Now, a recent audit of Facebook noted that their content moderation efforts remained, quote, too reactive and piecemeal, end quote. And, and harmful content continues to spill through the cracks. Critics of current content moderation efforts have urged social media companies to move away from uh, their current whack-a-mole approach and develop early warning policies that preventively flag situations where violence and atrocities are likely to occur. There's also concern that the over-reliance on content removal can lead to online censorship that restricts fundamental freedoms and actually drives extremist views. So it's a very, very tight rope that they are walking. Around the, con around the globe, rather, the spread of false or misleading information through social media is causing real harm by catalyzing violence and brutality toward religious communities. For example, in India, where Facebook has more users than any other country globally, it's what's app platform is used to spread hate speech and false information against religious minorities. Now in Pakistan, Facebook is used to target, frame, and accuse individuals of blasphemy, leading to detention, disappearances, extrajudicial killings, mob gatherings, and even public lynchings. Now government-sponsored hate speech and disinformation is particularly perilous as it fosters a dangerous culture of hate and religious intolerance where both online and offline abuses are condoned. The Russian Federation employs a very sophisticated disinformation network that targets religious minorities with sensational allegations designed to create fear and animosity against them. Jehovah's Witnesses 
are depicted in state media as dangerous and subversive, often with ties to Western interests. Government news programs accuse religious minorities of ties to revolutionaries in neighboring Ukraine and depict peaceful Muslim groups as terrorists. Uh, for example, in May 2019, a close advisor to President Putin published an op-ed claiming Americans and Israelis were plotting with Ukraine's President Zelensky to deport ethnic Russians from Ukraine, eastern Ukraine and replace them with Jews. In Iran, the government uses social media to spread anti-Baha'i propaganda while systematically harassing and jailing members of that community on the basis of their faith. Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, regularly tweets anti-Semitic vitriol from his official Twitter account, while at the same time restricting Twitter access for his own citizens. Iran's security apparatus regularly uses Instagram and Telegram to threaten members of Iran's Sufi community and followers of spiritualist Mohammed al-Talhari with physical harm. I will now turn to uh, Vice Chair Bargava to further explain what is being done by social media companies in response to online hate speech. Thank you very much, Vice Chair Perkins. The proliferation of hate and separately disinformation on social media has been a central concern in how religious communities have been targeted, targeted in so many countries that we at USURF engage and monitor. Burma is one prominent and horrific example. On August 25th of 2017, the Burmese military launched a genocidal campaign against the Rohingya people who are predominantly Muslim. Burmese military units have been involved in indiscriminate killings of civilians, mass rape, and arbitrary detentions and arrest. More than 740,000 Rohingya refugees fled to camps in Bangladesh, while another 120,000 are displaced internally. In Burma, Facebook is pre-installed on many mobile phones, which has allowed users to access the internet. Yet it has also led to a misperception that Facebook is the internet. And this has enabled hate and disinformation to go viral rapidly. The United Nations fact-finding mission for Myanmar concluded that Facebook enabled Buddhist nationalist and military officials to spread hateful and divisive rhetoric targeting the Rohingya. In August of 2018, Facebook, after significant pressure, blocked and removed the accounts of 20 Burmese individuals and organizations, including General Min Aulain and Buddhist monk Uwaratu. Despite these efforts, Facebook admitted in 2018 that it, quote, can and should do more, end quote, specifically noting its failure to prevent the platform's use to foment division and incite offline violence. During the first half of 2020, Facebook claimed it took action against more than 330,000 pieces of content in Burma. Yet reports continue that groups promoting hate and intolerance continue to use the platform, and the Burmese military reopened a Facebook page in June. Yusuf commends social media companies for increasingly taking down content that contains hate speech or in disinformation. Yusuf urges those companies to take steps, however, to support measures of accountability and to allow information to be used in investigations. Many social media companies rely on artificial intelligence, as Vice Chair Perkins talked about, to remove content. In doing so, the companies should make sure that any such content, which could be important evidence of violent crimes or of hate, can be used in efforts to bring perpetrators to justice. Facebook recently rejected a request by the Gambia to provide information relevant to the pending case against Burma for genocidal charges at the International Court of Justice or ICJ. Facebook has asserted that it has shared evidence with the UN investigatory mechanism for use in potential criminal prosecutions, but the head of ICJ has reiterated that Facebook has yet to release evidence that relates and underscores the seriousness of those crimes. Facebook must release evidence that could be used to hold responsible Burmese officials who committed alleged genocide against the Rohingya. 
Facebook in Facebook's inaction is not only a disservice to Rohingya victims demanding justice, it also fosters wider impunity. Those who spew hate online, whether governments or non-state actors may think twice if they know that social media companies are prepared to share their statements for use in future criminal proceedings. Thank you. And I look forward to hearing our witnesses' views on these global and concerning issues. I will now turn the floor back to Chair Manchin. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Vargaba and Vice Chair Tony Perkins. Uh, as, as we all know, and certainly uh, aware from the comments that have been made this morning, the issues are large and looming, and we are so honored to have the speakers with us today that bring with them a great amount of expertise and, and some uh, recommendations of how we can move forward in the future. And so we now uh, look forward to hearing from them. We have four speakers and I'm going to generally introduce them, but please know that um, on the website are very complete bios of, of all of our distinguished guests. And our first uh, panel, our panel will be David Kay, who is a clinical professor at, of law at the University of California, Irvine. From 2014 to 2020, he served as a United Nations Special Rapporteur on the promotion and protection of the right to freedom of opinion and expression. He is also the author of Speech Police, The Global Struggle to Govern the Internet uh, in 2019. And so David, uh, we welcome you and look forward to your comments. Thank you, Chair Manchin, and thanks to the entire commission for the opportunity to uh, to join you uh, this morning, this morning for me and and for you, I know not for the United Kingdom, uh, for this uh, hearing today. Uh, in my remarks, uh, I would like to highlight perhaps four specific areas, and I, I will try to keep it brief, in part because the comments that you, Chair Manchin, and your vice chairs and commissioners have already made. Um, really drilled down uh, and highlighted the many issues involved uh, with respect to hate speech online and religious freedom online. So what I would like to do is simply highlight four different areas. And, and I'll start with a general question of the sources of law, the sources of decision making that should be uh, at issue in this area. I'll say a few words about the companies I'll say a few words about governments, and then I'll say something a little bit more specific about the US government. And I'll try to do this all in just a few moments, <laughs> normally devoting an entire course to these kinds of, kinds of issues, but I know that you've already, you've already taken the course and are, and are practitioners in it. So the first point that I would like to make is, is actually a point that is drawn from the bipartisan history of the US commitment to international human rights law. The United States ratified the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in 1992 upon the strong recommendation of President George H.W. Bush. And the ICCPR, which is drawn from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, protects in Article 18 everyone's right to thought, conscience, and religion, the freedom of those principles. In Article 19, it promotes and protects everyone's right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, thus it's an international right, and through any media. And those two rights together, along with the permissible limitations that you mentioned already, Chair, in the context of Article 20, with respect to incitement that's based on national, racial, or religious hatred, 
um, and also the restrictions on expression that are permissible under Article 19 that must be necessary and proportionate, those principles, those principles of international human rights law, I think are the essential principles for us to be thinking about the rules that these multinational companies, companies that are not simply bound or enjoy the protections of the First Amendment in the United States, but also operate in countries around the world where their users and the people in the public who are impacted by them also enjoy these fundamental human rights. So the first point I wanna make is that there is a source of law and a source of decision-making that can be relevant to us. The second point I wanna make about companies, and so to focus on companies in particular, is that while we often talk about the content standards, that is the hate speech rules or the religious freedom rules that they should be implementing, which I fully subscribe to, I think we should also be thinking about rules of transparency. The companies, as I think some of the comments have already indicated, are rather opaque, both in their adoption of rules and their enforcement of those rules. And one of the problems that we have, both as researchers and you as commissioners and as advisors to legislators and to the executive branch, to policymakers, a very significant difficulty we have is understanding not just the rules, but how the rules are made and how they are implemented. And I would strongly encourage the conversation if not today, over time, to focus on that particular issue of transparency and the importance of companies being transparent about their work. Otherwise, the conversation is entirely asymmetrical, where the companies have all the information and we only have sort of the, the shadows of the information. The next point I wanna make is about government responsibility. Now, I think the commissioners have already indicated the, the problem and the problems that we see around the world with respect to governments inciting violence, governments promoting discrimination. And we have seen this in many parts of the world. We've seen not only the spread of anti-blasphemy laws, the spread of hate speech, anti-hate speech laws, and the spread of disinformation or fake news laws, which at some level clearly have a basis in law and policy. However, around the world, those rules are very often used as a tool against minorities, whether they're ethnic minorities or religious minorities or others. And I think one of the focal points for, certainly for the commission, I think historically the commission has paid attention to these kinds of issues, but because these laws are now being applied with, I would say extra vigor with respect to online services, I think the issues that we need to be focusing on to a certain extent are, is, are, is government regulation serving to promote religious freedom or is it serving to undermine religious freedom? Very often governments will make demands of the companies to either take down content or take action against users or accounts that are deeply problematic. And I think part of the effort moving forward should be not just focusing on the companies, but also focus on the governments that create a hostile environment to religious freedom and freedom of expression. And then the final point I'll make, and I, I really um, beg your forgiveness if I've gone over time, is to say a word about the US government. So the United States government, in part because of our historic protection of both religious freedom and religious tolerance, and our historic protection of the freedom of expression both of which are found in the First Amendment, the United States has a strong role to play internationally in promoting these values, in promoting them in governments around the world, 
in promoting them in the United Nations and in promoting them with respect to companies. However, and there is a however here, to the extent that the United States removes itself from the institutions of international governance, such as removing itself from the UN Human Rights Council, or to the extent that the United States seems to privilege one set of rights over other rights, even though, and I wanna emphasize this point, human rights are interdependent. Freedom of expression depends on freedom of religion, depends on freedom of assembly, depends on non-discrimination. All of these rights are connected to one another. And so as we move forward, I think it's important for the United States to re-engage with the institutions of international law, to regain a credibility that frankly has been lost over several years, not just the last few years, but over several years, to re-engage domestically by making the human rights conversation not only a conversation about what they're doing over there, but about what we do here, and make it a conversation about how we interact and bring international human rights law, which applies to governments, also to the table when it comes to companies. So with that, again, thank you very much for your time. I hope that my internet hasn't been too unstable uh, for, for this. Um, I know I've cut in and out here and there, but again, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you uh, very much, David. Yes, we, we heard you loud and clear and certainly appreciate uh, your work and the, the information you've shared this morning. And uh, after our speakers, we will come back with some questions. And so now we move to Susan Benish, who is the executive director of the Dangerous Speech Project. She serves as the faculty associate of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University and teaches human rights at American University School of International Service. Welcome, Susan, and thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Um... Uh, Chair Manchin and uh, all of the commissioners for uh, inviting me to offer you a few ideas alongside my wonderful fellow panelists. Um, since uh, uh, Vice Chair Perkins and Commissioner Bargava have already uh, described um, the uh, woefully numerous cases of um, hateful content and disinformation targeting religious communities around the world. Um, I will instead uh, describe for you some of the patterns that um, my colleagues and I have observed in that kind of content. And then I'll move as quickly as possible in my brief remarks to some ideas for how I think this problem can, uh, can be diminished. Um, uh, Chair Manchin mentioned the Dangerous Speech Project. That is the research group that I, that I founded after observing about a decade ago strong and striking similarities in the kind of rhetoric that malevolent leaders use to turn one group of people violently against another one. Um, it is extraordinary how, uh, how one can observe patterns in this kind of content across um, uh, across countries, across uh, uh, cultures, languages, and of course, across uh, religions and religious communities. Uh, this kind of rhetoric, which I named dangerous speech for its capacity to inspire violence, has been used all too effectively in, again, a great variety of countries and languages against myriad groups. It is language that may express hatred but this is really a key point. It is defined at least as much by fear as by hatred, since what is most powerful in it is that it is designed to generate violent fear of other people, since violent fear in turn makes um, a, a violent reaction seem defensive and often morally justified. Uh, this language is... Uh, Again, all too common around the world at present, and it often targets religious communities, as you have already 
heard. Let me just um, note a few striking trends in it uh, that we have observed in, in numerous uh, countries and contexts online um, in, in, in recent times. First of all, in some cases, this rhetoric suggests that there is something inherently wrong with a religion, most often Islam, as you know, and therefore with its followers. This familiar language has spiked just in the past few days in the aftermath of the appalling murder and decapitation last Friday of a French high school teacher, Samuel Paty. We have also seen a closely related tendency to conflate criticism of a religion on the one hand and disinformation about it with, on the other hand, criticizing or dehumanizing its followers. Content ostensibly describing a religion serves as a dog whistle for attacks on the relevant religious community. This kind of content tends to surge in the aftermath of events like the murder of Monsieur Paty or the Christchurch massacre in New Zealand, when gruesome images of killings also proliferate online so that social media companies find themselves occupied with trying to remove that. This often means that they therefore do not focus sufficiently on the hateful and false content that targets religious communities, even in the times when that content is most abundant, when it is rife. Another important trend that we have noticed is that rhetoric against religious communities often overlaps with xenophobia and the language of invasion. This language is a major hallmark of dangerous speech. It is particularly common in the sometimes self-described manifestos of people who carry out massacres aimed at particular groups. Uh, and this kind of language, this language of invasion, threatening, de describing a threat and, and a either a current or future invasion by another group of people, is very powerful since it suggests, often convincingly with the help of disinformation, that another group of people pose an existential threat. Again, this is terribly powerful language since it convinces people often that they must protect themselves and their families and their religious communities and their children by committing or condoning violence. I would be remiss not to mention also that hatred and disinformation are, are sometimes directed at religious communities from within by their own leaders. We have seen examples of this related to the COVID-19 pandemic quite recently, as in Bangladesh, Myanmar, Burma, and other countries where clerics encouraged their followers to attend large public gatherings, telling them that devout people were immune to the virus and that those who were warning the same people to be careful were insufficiently devout or even atheist. Uh, all of these types, these different types of content that I have described circulate online, of course. Now I'd like to offer some ideas for countering them uh, effectively. First, I, I uh, strongly uh, endorse um, the points that have been made by uh, Commissioner, well, in fact, by all of the speakers thus far, particularly uh, the concern expressed by um, Vice Chair Perkins and David Kay, uh, that uh, we must protect freedom of expression vigorously, even while finding the most effective ways to counter hate, hateful and uh, hateful content and disinformation. Uh, so here are some suggestions. I, I know my, uh, my time is running out, so I will simply sketch them and uh, look forward to your questions and do my best to answer them. Uh, the first is to work with social media companies to explain which content is dangerous, since although I have pointed out that there are striking uncanny similarities in this kind of content from case to case around the world, Understanding individual examples of it often requires an understanding of local context. And this is one of the main reasons why companies have failed in the past to, uh, to act with sufficient um, uh, uh, efficacy and precision uh, against such content. Since it is so highly context dependent often, it's not at all obvious which content, which content is dangerous and which is not, and how dangerous it is in its context. 
Companies need to make quick decisions in the event, so they must have access to high quality information in real time. This means building ties between companies and reliable uh, sources of information before there is um, a sudden surge of such content online. It's a, it's a must be preventative work, not reactive work. And indeed a great deal of, uh, uh, of content moderation is reactive um, as, the, as the common use of the term whack-a-mole to describe it suggests. Second, it is important to choose the right means of responding to harmful content. Uh, in many of the discussions, in the vast majority of discussions on this topic, only one kind of response or policy is discussed, and that is what the companies call takedown or removing the content. However, uh, that cannot be sufficient by itself, and in some cases may not even be the most effective response. Um, alternatives include what is often called demotion or downranking, which means making content less less uh, visible to fewer people. Um, companies, uh, including Facebook, are using this alternative quietly much more in numerous cases, including uh, specific cases where religious uh, communities have been targeted over the last year. Um, they are doing so, however, uh, as David Kay pointed out, in a, in this case, a completely opaque way. We might even say, uh, that the curtain is, is very dark, so, so the use of downranking is even more mysterious than opaque. Um, uh, so it is absolutely essential to develop a system for oversight regarding uh, the, the uh, responses, the policies that social media companies are using to respond to these and of course other kinds of harmful content. Uh, this, of course, also cannot be reactive. This must be the work of uh, policymakers from a variety uh, of sources, including but not limited to government. Uh, it is also absolutely vital uh, uh, for uh, making the right decisions to find sources of information and, and also speakers who are influential within the relevant community. That is to say, there is another possible response uh, that we, in fact, at the Dangerous Speech Project have been studying, a response to harmful content, um, which is to respond to it, literally, what is sometimes called counter speech. Um, this uh, can apparently be effective, especially if the counter speakers are people who are influential within the relevant community not nearly enough has been done to experiment with that possibility. I'll now conclude by mentioning two more steps that are absolutely essential in my view and currently uh, almost entirely missing from content regulation by tech companies. One is, as I've mentioned, oversight of which content they choose to remove or otherwise regulate. Here I want to point out that uh, we, those, those of us outside the companies, know almost nothing about those decisions at scale. Um, as Chair Manchin mentioned, uh, Facebook takes down millions of pieces of uh, what, it consider, what it considers to be hate speech um, uh, on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis. Um, we know only what uh, Facebook and other companies do regarding individual specific pieces of content when uh, there is a public controversy over, over such uh, content, uh, such as the innocence of Muslims, to take an example related to a religious community. Uh, we don't know on a given day what they are doing with the other approximately 2 million pieces of non-spam content they, that particular company takes down. Uh, the second uh, final step that is absolutely vital in my view is robust study of the effects of various interventions so that they can be chosen on the basis of data, not merely groping in the um, uh, dark without knowledge of the actual effects of these steps. With that, I'll conclude and, and as I said, invite your questions. Thank you so much. Susan, thank you so much. And uh, yes, obviously we see that this is not a, this is a complicated uh, situation. Uh, certainly with a lot of uh, uh, web 
going out in many different ways, both literally and figuratively. And so uh, it's now uh, my pleasure to, as we move over to London, to hear from uh, Dr. Shukatala uh, Banaji, <laughs> excuse me, for <laughs> Dr. Banaji. Such a pleasure to have you. Uh, Dr. Banaji is a professor of media, culture, and social change in the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of Economics, where she also serves as program director for the MSC Media, Communication, and Development. Uh, thank you for being with us uh, this afternoon from there, and please proceed. Thank you. Thank you very much. D thank you, commissioners, and thank you, esteemed colleagues. You've set it up um, in such an interesting and eloquent way um, in terms of the debates on hate speech and violence across the world that I think my case study, which is going to mainly focus on India, will be quite relevant and also will illuminate some of the points that you made. I'd like to start today by briefly outlining the sociopolitical context of hate speech, harmful content and violence in India and looking at the links between them. Amongst many in India and in the diaspora, there is a deep and widespread social prejudice against Muslims, Christians and Dalits. And I think it's advised for us to look way beyond the current focus on social media for the way in the, which this prejudice moves through communities. The prejudice drives extreme socioeconomic and spatial discrimination and repeated atrocity. And that's the context into which social media comes. Hundreds of thousands of instances of malicious orchestrated misinformation, disinformation and hate against Muslims, Dalits and Christians from li links to speeches, memes and GIFs to long video posts or blogs circulate daily on social media platforms and peer-to-peer -peer messaging apps such as WhatsApp, Facebook, ShareChat, Instagram, Twitter, Telegram and TikTok, to name but a few. For our sins, some of us in my department have had a lot of time and also spent a very, very um, serious few months examining some of this content when it comes to India. Cheap phones and data packages made available by corporate giant Reliance Geo since 2016, particularly courtesy of support, endless support from the Modi government, often preloaded with government apps, have made it easier than ever to promote hate and intolerance and to spread it deep within communities that previously one might not have thought to be connected. At points of heightened tension, for instance, I refer to recent events which took place in Bangalore and recent events earlier in the year in New Delhi. These rumors are triggered and become focal points for coordinated mob violence. Since 2015, I think most of you will be aware that there have been more than 120 instances of mob lynching, mainly against Dalits, Muslims, Christians and Adivasis, and based on entirely false allegations of cow slaughter, cow trafficking and ca cattle theft, but also of child theft and kidney snatching. In a recent horrific incident, a Muslim man who had a sacred number tattooed on his arm had his arm severed by a group of Hindu men in one such incident of hate. Many of these incidents are filmed by the perpetrators and circulated widely within social media groups, intentionally striking further fear into the hearts and minds of Muslim, Dalit and Christian communities. Those who dare to protest, the brothers, sisters, fathers and mothers of rape victims, for instance, or of lynched men, are harassed and intimidated threatened or even killed. Existing networks of disinformation lead to entrenched rumors that Muslims are intentionally, for instance, infecting Hindus with COVID-19. The context of COVID and the lockdowns in India have resulted then in further death caused by the turning away of Muslim citizens from hospitals, from educational institutions and residential settlements a horrible byproduct of the already networked context of disinformation. International human rights organizations such as, such as Amnesty International, which have been documenting the violence and oppression against Dalits, Muslims, Christians and Adivasis in India, 
have faced harassment and threat from the Indian state. It won't be any secret to you that Amnesty International recently had its bank accounts frozen and have made the decision to quit India. There is gr a growing atmosphere of fear and intimidation, not just amongst the civil society activists and journalists who are trying to document and protest the mob killings, but also amongst everyday communities of Muslims, Christians and Dalits who want to take up and fight for their own cause against the disinformation. I think it's very important, commissioners, that I make the point that we can't just talk about social media separated from mainstream media. Mainstream television and the social media context of anti-Muslim, anti-Christian and anti-Dalit hate posts and violence are closely connected. Hate speech, misinformation and disinformation that circulates on social media in India is really linked to hate speech, misinformation and disinformation that circulate and are produced by mainstream media outlets. Both are linked to and contain malicious disinformation and hate speech by members of the ruling party and the government. This is something that many people fail to mention when they talk about social media hate. There's a clear continuum between the formats, the types of hate, the content of posts on mainstream and social media in multiple vernacular languages, Hindi and English. My colleagues and I have traced the use of fiction media formats in posts which are whipping up fear and anxiety about particular members of communities. Everyday forms of hate speech and incitement against Indian Muslims, Christians, Dalits and Rohingya refugees and Adivasis are normalized by mainstream media, such as Republic TV and Sudarshan News. Hateful WhatsApp messages against Christians, Muslims and Dalits work in tandem with ideas which circulate in family and community conversations outside the local cigarette shop or in the local mobile, mobile phone shop. A variant of any particular stereotype or hateful narrative containing misinformation will often appear at the same time in mainstream news media and in social media, a form which we call transmediality and which has really propagated many of the COVID conspiracy theories circulating at the moment. Therefore, when some users call on their technical media literacy to go to multiple sources when in doubt, they often find only verification and repetition of false information and hate against Muslims, Dalits and Christians. The political ties of those who spread hateful misinformation are central to the allowance of attacks against Muslims, Dalits and Christians in India. The same perpetrators of hateful speech against these communities with ties to the Indian BJP and RSS for instance, the politician Kapil Mishra repeatedly flout the regulations on incitement and get away with it. During the recent Delhi violence of February 2020, in which more than 50 people were murdered by mobs or shot to death by police, more than two thirds of the victims were Muslims. The accounts of those who suffer bodily and financial harm are changed or refuted by the police. WhatsApp groups such as the Hindu Qatar Ekta were allowed to organize pogroms with impunity, despite some of their members being known to incendiaries. Colleagues, in this context, I really feel we need to ask how much we can call on the law and legal representatives in India to support us in the fight against hate speech. Media researchers and journalists with whom we are in touch for our work on social media hate have tracked the spread of and connection between hateful political speech, hateful postings online and violence across multiple Facebook accounts and WhatsApp groups who are run sometimes by people with connections to the ruling party and to the police. Attempts to combat misinformation and to instill media literacy are weakened by systemic and the official nature of prejudice circulating throughout. For instance, let's look at fact checkers such as Factly, Boom Live and Alt News, which are overwhelmed by the volume and diversity of hateful misinformation against Muslims, Christians and Dalits, or against critical or dissident individuals in India. Far right misinformation outlets have also set up their own fact checkers to discredit accurate information about hate speech and violence. Paid and unpaid trolls in their hundreds of thousands in India also delegitimize accurate reports and delegitimize anyone engaging in counter speech. 
platforms and corporations currently pursue sensationalism and profit over a commitment to all communities' quality of life and rights, despite the fact that many of them avow a commitment to um, freedom of speech and quality of life. Most mechanisms for reporting incitement in India on social media are merely technological and even where there are human subjects involved in looking at the misinformation, much further action is needed because there are many disappointed users who do report hate speech and get nowhere. Many supposedly mild posts containing misinformation about particular communities and their leaders go under the radar because they are disguised as jokes or metaphors and never make it onto the list of what counts as hate speech. So I want to conclude in the last minute by talking about a number of possible solutions to reduce such anti-minority hate speech and violence. International bodies including the governments of the United States and governing bodies in the EU and international corporate organizations need to acknowledge and inform themselves about the links between various authoritarian regimes, government allied vigilantes, corporate platform executives and hateful disinformation. There needs to be a meaningful social and economic incentive given to any government which takes action against hate speech, including an early warning system about impending anti-Muslim, anti-Christian and anti-Dalit violence. There needs to be powerful business incentives to platforms and corporations which take swift action. Currently, I think it's more encouraged than discouraged to ignore hate speech. Twitter, Alphabet and Facebook urgently need to join with local and international human rights organizations who know the on the ground context to ensure that their employees undergo rigorous human rights training on what constitutes hate speech. There needs also to be a database of Islamophobic and anti-Dalit content in line with the same kinds of databases around misogyny and pornography, which have been used very successfully, I think, in international content. I will stop there and hope that my colleagues can ask some questions which push this issue further. Thank you very much. Absolutely, uh, Dr. Banaji, I'm sure there will be. And thank you so much for your input uh, on this subject. And last, but certainly not least, Dr. Waris Hussain uh, is a human rights attorney specializing in digital rights, human rights defenders, and business and human rights. He is the former South Asian policy analyst for the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. And so we welcome him uh, this morning and eager to hear your comments. Dr. Warris. Well, thank you, um, uh, Chair of Manchin, and thank you to the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom for hosting this important discussion regarding the convergence of religious freedom and the ever-expanding digital world in which we're living. This was a conversation that we started to have while I was working at USERF as an analyst, so I'm, I'm glad to see that it's culminated in this, uh, in this hearing, and I'm, and I'm thankful to you all for carrying that forward. I'm also very um, honored to be serving on a panel with one of my personal he heroes, Professor David Kay, who's here, um, who is a continual inspiration for, for people who are trying to get involved in this digital rights space um, from a legal perspective. So um, I've changed my talking points as everyone was talking, so I don't repeat anything any, anyone else said. So we'll try and keep things fresh. Uh, but I'll focus on my, my comments on regional developments in South and Southeast Asia, which seems to be a running theme that a lot of the speakers and commissioners have mentioned. Um, to give an overall assessment, I think one must understand, just as Professor Banerjee pointed out, that the already existing issues relating to religious minorities continue to impact all countries in the region as they have for generations. While social, economic, and political disenfranchisement of religious minorities persists, the speed and reach of hate speech and fake news has changed dramatically with the astronomical expansion of internet access in Asia. Uh, think of religious bigotry as a pre-existing condition, a cancer, and think of proliferated internet access as metastasizing that cancer. It's speeding the growth of that disease, right? Um, and as of 2020, out of 4 billion people living in Asian countries, more than 2 billion now are connected to the internet. That's twice as many users as there was just 10 years ago. Uh, we've seen the democratization of the information sector, where a TikTok video um, by a 16-year-old in a remote Pakistani village can go more viral than a hard-hitting story by the BBC um, on a similar topic. This presents opportunities for both good and bad faith actors, um, along with religious bigots who use social media to expand the reach of their message. 
And with this extended or expanded reach, we have seen interrelated issues that allow for misinformation and disinformation along with hate speech to be proliferated and cause real world harm, which is what, exactly what uh, the commissioners were mentioning in their introductory remarks, particularly for religious minority communities. Um, as the internet access has blossomed in Asia, we've also seen, as we've seen uh, from the comments up till now, mob violence unleashed on minority uh, neighborhoods based on fake news going viral. Uh, very little digital education for users, making it hard for them to distinguish between information, disinformation, and misinformation. Um, the persistence of inauthentic behavior relating to religious minority communities that can be connected to troll armies or troll farms. Um, social media platforms taking a far too passive role in content moderation, with it, which I think Professor Kay has rightly criticized um, via Twitter and by his engagement with these social media companies that they just aren't doing perhaps enough. And then traditional legal tools and methods are either unable or unwilling to keep up pace with the technological advancements. So we need innovation and we need new ideas, not just analogizing what we have already in terms of law or legal paradigms to um, the digital space. We need new ideas for that. Um, some of the some solutions, let's, let's go through some of the solutions that actually we've seen in South Asia, particularly um, for these issues and then see where there might be a gap or where there might be something to speak on. Um, some of the solutions that have been implemented to stop the spread of hate speech or fake news uh, with real world mob violence are overexpensive to the point of violating other human rights, like the rights to free speech or the access to information. Uh, one, of the, one of these overexpensive solutions is the increased use of internet shutdowns in countries like Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, to deal with hate speech and fake news. So in some instances, like in Sri Lanka, the shutdown is put in place to counter a viral news story falsely accusing Sri Lankan Muslims of various wrongdoings. This could actually instigate mob violence and a violent attack on the community. Um, in one way, this kind of swift, swift action by the government can actually save lives. It can actually stop a mob from forming and attacking religious minorities. But in another way, the over-reliance, overuse, and over-expansion of shutdowns can have a counterproductive effect of encumbering interfaith efforts by activists to counter misinformation with increased cooperation between the majority and minority religious groups. Related to shutdowns, in Pakistan, there's a history of closing access to particular websites using takedown requests, or rather uh, using takedown requests uh, to silence certain users on websites like TikTok, Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter. As you may know, uh, TikTok was banned by the Pakistani government 10 days ago, and the ban was lifted randomly without any transparency on why that decision was taken. Um, so that's something that's happening in terms of takedown of sites. And in, also, in terms of YouTube, uh, YouTube was remain, has remained, or was at least, inaccessible uh, due to a government shutdown because of an alleged blasphemous video uh, for several years. And the government telecommunications authorities have consistently played a role in silencing religious minorities, particularly Ahmadis, in posting content that the authorities unfairly deem as blasphemous. Uh, and they go to social media companies to take down content based on Pakistani law, which criminalizes blasphemy. This goes back to what Professor Kay was saying as it relates to already existing laws that are being brought into the digital field and then uh, almost they're over, over applied because the digital space is so wide and vast. Having laid out these difficult scenarios, I believe that the speed of communication both uh, has both good and bad repercussions, um, and the speed has gone into overdrive with the penetration of internet access in Asia. While religious bigots have become increasingly adept at using this increased speed to their advantage, governments, activists, and social media companies are lagging far behind without producing effective and narrowly tailored solutions. And the goal for all three of these parties, governments, activists, and social media companies is to come together in good faith and create social, legal, and technological solutions that not only protect religious minorities, but also protect the right to free speech and open dialogue. While analogizing traditional legal solutions from non-digital forms of press and communication can be helpful, um, policymakers have to understand that there are unique challenges posed in the digital space, and therefore there is a need for wholly new legal paradigms and solutions rather than retrofitting existing rules or traditions. Um, also, the silo that exists between engineers and technical experts and human rights sociologists or linguistic specialists have to be broken down um, in order to avoid the kinds of mistakes we've been continually making in creating narrowly tailored or rather siloed uh, digital strategies. And the human rights community needs to understand the limits and capabilities of the technology, while the engineers need to understand the value uh, the, of the input from human rights specialists or linguistic specialists to bake into the technology ways to ensure safety, dignity, 
and respect for religious minorities rather than trying to reverse engineer a solution once a problem has ar arisen with the technical issues. So a few of the specific recommendations we can talk through, and I'll try and be very quick with these. Um, I think the AI that was mentioned, the artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence perhaps need to be bolstered by human intelligence, right? Human is also an important part of uh, creating, of uh, facilitating an artificial intelligence that makes sense. Um, along with that, deprioritizing or downtracking content, which uh, Professor Benish had been talking about, that straddles the line between hate speech um, and free speech could also be an alternative tool. So we have to have different tools in our toolbox, not just taking down the content, but also maybe deprioritizing it and prohibiting it from going viral. Um, in addition, I think one of the things we can look at is that there's already existing um, sort of paradigms that look to early warning mechanisms for genocide, early warning um, action that look at heat maps, essentially saying uh, a post in X, Y, and Z country, a post in Pakistan could cause violence at a much faster rate than it might in a country like France, for example, or maybe not, France is not a great example considering what they're going through right now, but different countries have different um, uh, sort of contexts with which to analyze how likely is speech to cause uh, harm. We can't apply a global standard necessarily. We do have to look at country specific examples. And then finally, I think that the adversarial relationship that we have uh, that exists between technological technology companies, social media companies and governments has to be broken down in a way that becomes more collaborative and less adversarial. It feels like oftentimes these social media companies are rushing to create policies so that they can avoid government regulation on those policies rather than thinking of a way to collaborate with government authorities to create policies that make more sense. So I know that's a lot of information I've thrown at everyone. I'll stop talking there and I'll uh, transfer it over to, uh, to Chair Manchin for the question. Well, thank you. Thank you so much uh, to all of our speakers, uh, unfortunately. And I think uh, David K, Dr. K mentioned this uh, early uh, in our program that uh, he did have to leave at uh, 12 for another commitment, so he will not be available for questions, but certainly uh, our other panelists are still with us. And I'm just going to begin, uh, and I kind of throw this question out uh, to uh, one of you or all three of you, but you know, when we look at this, <laughs> that the how comprehensive and sort of all in, engulfing this issue is. Um, but when we actually know for a fact that hate speech or disinformation is actually being government sponsored uh, in a country, that they are the ones leading it, then obviously you can't go to the government looking for help on how to solve it. So kind of broadly in terms of what we can do, uh, not only as USERP, but certainly the US government, and actually uh, intervening with government-sponsored hate speech. Can I, can I pick up on that, Com Commissioner Manchin? I, I thought that was a very interesting question and a good segue from the previous speaker because Dr. Hassan talked about cooperation between governments and platforms. But in India, we've seen the absolute opposite problem, which is there is cooperation to suppress actions against hate speech. And the recent case of Anki Das, who was um, for, several, for several years actually um, continued her own agenda of anti-Muslim postings, as well as suppressing um, attempts to take down hateful material against the Muslim and Christian communities on behalf of the BJP government. So I think um, I, would, I would say alongside you that I think we need an initiative which is multi-platform. I don't think that it can come from the United States government. I think it needs to be multi-stakeholder and it needs to be multi-country. And that's the only way in which it would retain both its integrity and its ability to do its job. Thank you. Susan. You're on mute, Susan. First, first I, I couldn't agree more with what Dr. Banaji has, uh, has said um, in all points. Um, I, I'd also like to add just a note that um, this is a, a as, as, as you said, uh, Chair Manchin, it's a serious problem 
um, uh, regarding many governments around the world. In fact, many of the governments where religious communities suffer the most uh, uh, hateful content and disinformation are exactly the places where the governments are um, either producing such content uh, or paying large numbers of people to produce it or um, um, strongly, tacitly encouraging that or all of the above. Um, when when uh, advocates like me ask the tech companies why they're not more vigorous in taking down such content, they sometimes say, well, you know, um, we're operating in this country as, as I believe it was uh, Vice Chair Perkins mentioned, India is, uh, he said, the country in which Facebook has the largest number of users, but Facebook calls it its biggest market, notably. Um, so when, for example, just to take another government, when Turkey uh, reports enormous amounts of content for takedown to Facebook, uh, and the Facebook uh, staff look at it and see that it's mostly content that is sympathetic to Kurds, just for an example. Um, the Facebook staff say, well, it's very difficult, you know, we can't very well go into court on every single one of these uh, cases. Uh, they're also afraid of being prosecuted in the various uh, countries. So um, it seems to me we, we must seek ways in which the companies can push back more strongly against such governments. And as Dr. Banaji has said, one uh, way for them to do this is to do it not individually, but collectively. There's just beginning to be talk of some kind of um, meta uh, organization among companies. Uh, we have an example in what's called GIFCT, which is a consortium uh, of companies um, um, to identify and take down uh, terrorist content. Um, there are also other possibilities such as, I'll, I'll now uh, uh, reference David Kay, who sadly had to leave us, but David is one of the principal people who've been advocating for uh, requiring companies to adhere to international human rights norms for um, content moderation. If they do that, companies could say to countries that are demanding takedown that is not in uh, keeping with international human rights law, companies could then say, sorry, we, we must abide by the law. Um, I, I will say very honestly that I suggested this to a, a, a colleague, um, coincidentally someone from India, who laughed and said, don't be silly. Those, those countries, those governments are not taking human rights law seriously in any respect already. What makes you think that if the if the companies use uh, uh, a legal basis for pushback that they'll take it seriously. But you know, those of us who've been working with human rights law, including uh, all of the commissioners uh, for a long time, know that like, like many pursuits, it's, it's an uphill battle. It isn't always successful, but uh, these are at least uh, um, possibilities. And of course, um, as has been mentioned, the, the companies are often, um, uh, making policy in order to fend off regulation by governments. So if governments, not singly, but, but jointly, can assure the companies that to push back against um, um, overbroad and uh, repressive regulation of speech demanded by certain governments um, is seen favorably, uh, then the companies will have more incentive to, uh, uh, to push back harder. They must Thank do you, that. I, I know. Yes. Yes. Um, I, as I mentioned a little earlier, I, I'm going to have to leave in a few minutes also for another USERP event. So if I could squeeze a question under the wire here, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Um, um, I'm, um, I, I must admit, I'm still sort of hung up on, on uh, what was referred to by a number of our participants on how to balance the um, incredibly important public policy goal of 
trying to limit hate speech with the broader question of freedom of speech generally. And uh, I'm not sure, um, I still understand how to, to, to completely do that. Um, there, there's some examples that are so obvious. I mean, if you're, if somebody's saying that Muslims are uh, intentionally spreading COVID and that's resulting in Muslims not being able to access medical quick care, I think everybody would agree that that is a you know hate speech that's having very real consequences. And likewise, the you know the blood libels that have been used against Jews for centuries. I think we all know that that's beyond the pale, and social media should not permit that sort of uh, of just ridiculous hate to to, uh, to spread. But then I, I look at a situation like Western Europe, where I think there are legitimate debates going on about whether the influx of large numbers of uh, migrants from third world countries that don't have the same attitudes as Western Europe does about women's rights, about sexual minorities, about religious pluralism, um, I think there are legitimate concerns on both the right and the left in Europe that maybe that mass migration needs to be slowed down or severely restricted. And how, how do we make sure a legitimate debate like that takes place without those arguing for restrictions on the mass migration being labeled as haters or engaging in hate speech? Anybody or everybody? <laughs> I'm yeah, I'll defer to Susan, but I just wanted to say very briefly that um, actually I'm afraid you can't just get away with saying that some debates are legitimate and completely and some debates are not because part of that legitimacy is also giving legitimacy to people who engage in violence. I'm afraid there's a continuum and I speak from Western Europe where the bodies have been washing up on the shores. And so there is a continuum between the debate. And again, nobody here is saying the debate shouldn't be happening. It's more that it results in violence for one group of people and not the other. So it's never the group of people who are saying, we have concerns about these people coming here who end up dead on the beaches or who get beaten to death in racist incidents on our streets. So I just wanted to make that point before the others come in and answer the question, that there is a continuum between something that looks like legitimate debate and something that ends in death and blood. Well, I, I mean, I, I would beg to disagree. I mean, there's, there's a lot of evidence that there are things being taught in mosques in Western Europe that does in fact lead to Islamic extremists engaging in violence to other religious groups or seculars or uh, sexual minorities. If I may, um, uh, I think I've, I've, I've heard you both saying that there is some speech that's, uh, in my terms, dangerous. In other words, that some speech leads to violence, it seems. Um, to answer the question, I would suggest that uh, every society in lots of ways, most of them not written down, most of them not, not actually law, <clears throat> develops and enforces what would be called, you know, in academia, discourse norms. Certain you're, you're, you're permitted to say some things and not permitted to say other things. In your family, around your kitchen table, in your religious community, in a house of worship, uh, on a on a on a on a um, field where you're playing a particular sports game, etc. Uh, we all abide constantly by these by these unwritten rules about what one may say and what one may not say according to what the rest of the community thinks. Those are norms. Um, online, the rules are written and enforced by a very small number of people who come mostly from one cultural background. Uh, it used to be that they were mostly Californians. Now that's not so much the case. The, the social media companies do have employees and even policymakers from, from a variety of backgrounds. 
However, the rest of us outside the companies really don't have a good sense of what they are, where they're drawing the lines in practice. So the first thing we need is, in my view, um, a system of oversight so that we do understand where they're drawing lines. And the second thing I believe we need is, um, although it will be difficult, uh, uh, to change their, their um, claim that they're making one set of rules for the entire world. Facebook claims to have one set of what they call community standards for the whole world. Think about that. Facebook famously bans nudity. And so that would suggest that they're using the same rule in Sweden and in Saudi Arabia, which as, as you, can, you can imagine is nuts since different communities of all kinds have, have, have different norms for speech and for behavior. So the second thing I would propose is that, that uh, companies develop some form of uh, a system for some kind of input so that people from at least a country, if not uh, from a region, perhaps this should happen on a, on a, on a more localized level, but they uh, should permit systematic input from people who are affected, who are governed by their rules into those rules and in particular into the enforcement of those rules. So that number one, the rest of us who live under these rules understand how they're actually being enforced and number two, so that there is some mechanism for input. Facebook has um, announced a, a new, what they call oversight board, um, which is a, a collection of mostly lawyers, uh, many, but not only Americans, um, who will have, once this board gets going in a few more months, uh, some sort of input. But the input, and this is a really key point, is only into the rules, not the enforcement. And we know from American criminal justice and all too many other examples that if all you know is, is the rules on paper and you don't know how they're being enforced, you don't really know what's happening out there. Thank, thank you very much. I, I apologize again for uh, needing to leave and I, I'd love to continue the conversation uh, uh, past the day with, with each of you. And I want to thank you all again uh, for your enlighten, enlightenment that I've gotten on some of these issues and uh, on this important topic. Uh, it's good to spend time with you this morning. Again, Thank sorry you. I didn't take off. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Bayer, Bauer. And uh, I'd, I'd like to turn over to Vice Chair uh, Anaruma Bargava uh, to see if uh, she would like to ask a, a question before we go to uh, other commissioners. Sure, thank you, Chair Minchin. Um, I, I do I have a couple questions and I'm gonna try to um, speak to a few of the things um, that just got mentioned and then um, that, that uh, Dr. Bonnerjee mentioned about um, incentives. And so, uh, Susan, I wanna, I wanna start where you just ended, right? Which is the question of enforcement because I've had those same conversations with social media companies where it's sort of like, we could have this community set of norms globally, right? And, and then it's sort of on governments to enforce. And then we have the problem laid out very, very succinctly and beautifully by Dr. Banerjee about what happens when the governments are not enforcement, enforcing and in fact, not even allowing the space for others to try and identify or hold those accountable or, or even be able to report, right? So, so in that context, um, you had mentioned, a number of you had mentioned sort of incentives and, I, and, and, and I'm sort of wondering what those incentives would be um, because uh, the, the, so, the, the, the social and economic incentives to governments in this context. And so this goes back, Susan, to your, your point, which is that if it's a market, right, um, and the market works on what we know it works on, which is for both hate and disinformation, clickbaits and lots of other people showing up. And, and how do you actually think about what the social and economic incentives are to enforce in a really different direction. Um, when, it's, when it's not a right, rights-based enforcement, it seems like it's an economically driven uh, incentive that we're thinking about. So, so for, for all of you in different ways, I just wanna ask both about um, how, how, how do we think about the governments enforcing what are the social economic incentives that you were talking about, Dr. Banerjee, and then also for, for the market-based way in which, you know, as, as um, you know, some who, who I'm thinking about you know, Joan Lanier and others who talk about like what it means to have, you know, a conversation between two people and the companies are here to sort of manipulate it. How do you actually then change that context 
um, to account for what we're seeing for religious communities. Well, I'd love to jump in quickly because this was the, um, one of the main issues that we found in our work on, on WhatsApp. So I'll, I'll use WhatsApp as an example because I know that in the Indian market, they clearly are trying to become um, a, a mechanism for using payment, which is in competition with an Indian one called Paytm. So they, they need to be secure. And an incentive for them, for example, and incentives can, uh, cannot be across the board. They need to be tailored to particular companies in particular circumstances. So for them, an incentive would have been to ensure that their decisions around hate speech were not um, somehow um, making them unappointable or unemployable as an alternative payment transaction company. No, I'm, not, I'm not supporting them in their sort of capitalist aim for for global supremacy in the in the payment market or the financial transaction market but i think what you'd need to do is you need to ensure that making decisions in favor of human rights were not then being used for them disfavorably when it came to economic competition with local companies so where you might have the government awarding a contract for um, financial transactions to a sweet local company who is okay with hate speech being circulated in their other forms and formats and i think what you can see in india is the building up of particular global Indian global corporations with the um, absolute agreement of the Indian government and who then turn a blind eye to things that are going on with regard to hate speech when it favors the ruling party. So for example, Reliance Geo, which I talked about, who have somehow beaten off all competitor phones. We almost had a situation where you know Vodafone had to leave India because their debts were being called in. You've got these situations where at the moment it's a very unbiased, you know, sort of, uh, it's, an, it's untenable to compete in that market with with companies who will turn a blind eye to human rights abuses and will therefore be given contracts so that would be an incentive for example a level playing field uh, not that i think the playing field is level but um that that's a possibility i mean if i could build off of that um i think there's a really great question um from commissioner bargava in terms of incentivizing um i also think that this is sort of categorically we need to look or at least technology companies need to look at what their role is in a society or is in culture right i think that they're going off the capitalistic and sort of the market will lead and that's who will will sort of reward with the algorithm etc cetera, etc cetera. but if there was a difference within the companies themselves who felt they have a social obligation to perhaps counter speech there's a big um sort of area where influencers right young users or, or users who are very very influential and can spread a message quickly um are kind of chosen by the algorithm itself right now, but if companies themselves were to look for people who are doing exactly what we were talking about earlier, looking at uh, building communities, building bridges, that they're good at that, they could be awarded with influencer status, not with fake followers, but that the algorithm could preference those users as well. That's something that could at least have that conversation like you were talking about, Commissioner Bargava, how do we level the playing field, right? I think that's one way to level the playing field, but it requires these companies to look at themselves in a completely different light than they do currently, right? Um, the other thing that I would mention that, I, I, and I know that this is pie in the sky, but I'm a pie in the sky kind of guy, right? We need some kind of a treaty. We need a multilateral treaty that, that speaks to some of these issues. And I think to award governments, right, um, based on sort of that treaty goes along with everything else in international law, that, that you sign on to treaties, you become part of the international community, you're given certain access and given certain points of technical assistance, et cetera, from UN bodies, et cetera, et cetera. So if we had a treaty that did this, we could have multilateral ways in which the United Nations or other international bodies could actually reward or assist governments who are trying to do the right thing. For example, like a human rights committee that has leaders, right, that has chosen and elected leaders who help formulate the implementation of that, of the treaties could be something that if you had a technology treaty or a digital treaty, you could reward the countries that are doing this content moderation the right way, that are doing the takedowns the right way. And I guess going back to what uh, Professor Banaji said, my, my video dropped out, but I think I would distinguish between uh, co-conspiring and collaborating. So I think in India, what we have is co-conspiracy happening on a lot of things with the technology companies and, and, and the person that you mentioned at the company, whereas uh, collaboration was something else that I was discussing of like good faith interaction between the companies and, and the governments themselves, rather than trying to uh, have it be sort of led by uh, a political goal. So I would I would say that for both the uh, the companies themselves, they have to look at their role in a different way in order for them to award influence and and 
push up the algorithm to certain users who are actually pushing good content out. Um, and then the, the multilateral approach through treaty bodies would be something that we could try. Of course, I think uh, Susan mentioned, you know, that some practitioners would laugh at that, but that's not possible. It's, it's pie in the sky, but I think we have to make some big asks and we have to think imaginatively about what can we do? Maybe not now, but maybe in five or 10 years. And that's something we have to think about doing. Thank you. Susan, did you wish to add to that? No, I've talked a lot and everyone else has been so eloquent that no need. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Davey, would you, uh, do you have a question you'd like to present as we kind of come down to our final, uh, the almost the end? <laughs> thank you, Chair Manchin. And I, I want to thank the panelists again for uh, this very enlightening, as uh, Commissioner Bauer said, uh, conversation, uh, very educational for me. One of the things I'm curious about uh, is this notion of um, trying to be less reactive in enforcement and oversight and more anticipatory. And it seems to me that um, reaction is sort of inherent in oversight and enforcement. Um, and so even in the best of the worlds, let's say we had a, we had a set of international acceptable standards uh, around what is legitimate content when it comes to speech uh, and other things. Um, does the technology exist or could the technology exist that would uh, filter out um, violators, if you will, prior to uh, its presence, the presence of, a, of, a, of speech on a particular platform? Maybe I, I will just jump in quickly on this one. I'm so grateful to you, Commissioner, for asking that question, which is a vital one. Um, it would be so nice in, and such a relief if someone could build a classifier, as, they, as the techies call it, that would, if, let, let me say this, it would be marvelous if, first of all, somebody could build a system uh, to identify all the content that is bad and distinguish it clearly from the content that isn't in advance. That would be very tough. Think about how difficult it is simply to get people to agree on what, in, what isn't hate speech. We have no consensus definition for hate speech. As uh, the chair mentioned, it doesn't exist in international law. It doesn't exist. There are many definitions, but they're almost all different. And then if I gave all of you a set of 10 examples, I'm willing to bet you something really nice that you would code them differently, that different ones among you would call specific examples of content, uh, hate speech and not. So if you can't get humans to agree, it is uh, terribly difficult to build software that can consistently agree on something. Um, and of course, it, it is such a tempting idea in part because people are expensive. That's one reason why the companies are trying very hard to build this software. Uh, Facebook has increased by many thousands of people its, its um, content moderation armies um, over the last few years under pressure from, from people like the panelists. Um, but that, that job, as you can imagine, does terrible damage to people. Uh, there's a very good film that was made about it in which a young woman talks about having watched a great many beheading videos. So for so many reasons, it would be marvelous to have software. However, um, it, is, it is a very scary idea for those of us interested in freedom of expression. And that's all of us, I know, since we're all human rights people. Um, in particular, I, I worry terribly about prior censorship, about uh, building and deploying software that would take content down just as soon as it's posted, especially if, once again, we continue to do all of this without any mechanism for oversight. Facebook is running, I, I, as I, I began a recent article with this line, Facebook is running the largest system of censorship that the world has ever known. Facebook by itself, never mind the other companies. It's bigger than that, that, that uh, than, than, than the system um, of any government, even including China's. And yet we don't know what they're doing. 
So uh, uh, they are using algorithms, using algorithms is just a, a, in this context, a term for software. They're, they're, they're using automated methods more than ever before, especially now because of the pandemic. They sent lots of their subcontracted content moderators home because of COVID. So at this moment, more hate speech is being taken down automatically from online platforms than ever before. Uh, in fact, I've, I've, I've written with a wonderful colleague a piece pleading that this not quietly become the status quo after the pandemic finally ends, especially if we, if we don't have any oversight. It should terrify us that all of this is being done in the dark with no, with no oversight. Um, and of course, those of us who want to prevent violence also want to try to help them to get it right. It's, it, it, it is this, as, as uh, um, Vice Chair Perkins said, uh, I think he, he said it's a very tight there that the companies are walking. It's tremendously important for them not to fall off on either side, not on the squelching speech side or on the um, uh, failing to take down awful content side. And I, I, I'm sorry, I know I'm talking a lot. I just want to mention one last thing. We cannot, due to the lack of oversight, even begin to get answers to questions like, if um, um, uh, Indians post a particular type of content and Pakistanis also post that kind of content, is it be being taken down at the same rate? If women post certain kinds of content and men post, is that if whites and African Americans, et cetera, et cetera, how is it possible? If Christians post a particular kind of content and Muslims, Hindus and, Muslims, and so on, we who are all so, um, uh, in, I think, uh, wisely interested in uh, equality and non-discrimination and uh, the enjoyment of human rights, how is it that we cannot um, seek answers to these critical questions about the means of communicating that have become so, so important and dominant all around the world? Just to add on to that, I think the, the mistake we can make here is by becoming static in our analysis. And I think that's why the over-reliance of technology gives us a static mentality that we just can't afford. It has to be dynamic. The users are changing as they go. The companies are changing as they go. The situations on the ground are becoming hotter or colder as they go. So I definitely understand where Commissioner Davy is coming from. Where can we have a little bit of reliance in terms of like what's happening here? How can we have technology be a solution? But I think perhaps up till now, our over-reliance on thinking of technology as a solution in a static sort of way may have been the reason that we've gotten here and why things have gotten out of control. And we should maybe make it a more dynamic approach, just like uh, Professor Benish was saying, having that mix of AI, having that mix of content moderators are human. I think we just can't look, I mean, I, I love the idea that we could have a technical fix all and that would take care of everything. I just think that we haven't found it yet. So I think that we should maybe stop relying so much on it and then looking at a more dynamic perspective. I'm so sorry. Professor Banerjee, I know you wanted to say something. I'll quiet down. And I, let me just say for the record, I'm not advocating a particular position. It's more of, out of curiosity and having my own, um, uh, I guess, intellect around this piqued by the conversations that we've just had over the last 90 minutes. I think it's a great question, Commissioner Davey, and I think there are ways in which we can introduce technology into supporting human action around these issues. So for instance, the building of databases, which I know have been done by multilateral agencies around child pornography and child trafficking, which is one of the most important steps forward in building a database of things which look innocuous, but which actually aren't, which have led to actual harm. And so if we start a database from the basis that if something has caused actual harm, let us say someone has lost a job or their employment has gone or they've had their arm chopped off because of it. That thing is marked as hate speech, whatever you or I may debate in our, in our academic setting about that. Then we could, we could actually assist those people, both in corporations and in governments who are looking at this material on a daily basis. So we can, um, databases can be technologized, they can be easily shared. And, and I start from the premise that if we did that around things like anti-Christian postings, anti-Muslim postings, things or uh, anti-Dalit content, which is very rife in the US and in, in the UK as well, um, we, would, we would be moving forward considerably. Can I just Thank say you. that it's Thank you. 
on that one part, of, and I know we're past time, Dr. Banerjee, I just wanted to say, um, I, I feel like the, the ways in which you're talking about early warning systems should require that we don't actually have to have an arm cut off um, before we realize that the consequences of what it is that's being said lead to an arm being cut off, right? And so um, we know that, we, we've seen it, that's what the heat maps are telling us, that's what the early warning systems can, can really grab, grab onto, and, um, and, and to recognize that it's not, um, you know, we don't need the consequence, which is so difficult to demonstrate right now um, in, in so many different contexts for even someone to be able to come forward. Um, that, that I think it's important, as you said, that when we see lives being lost and, 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 the, and the consequences of it, that we, we, we account for the fact that we, we have a good idea of what's about to happen. And we also realize that people are intending for that to happen. Um, and that is the saddest part of this, <laughs> this conversation. So um, thank you again. Well, Vice Chair Bargava, uh, thank you, and uh, Commissioner Davey, thank you. What a great question to sort of uh, bring our conversation uh, back around together. And obviously, if this were easy, um, we wouldn't have it as a problem. And so uh, we continue to, to look, research, think about, uh, how we can be more proactive rather than so reactive um, in these situations. But I, again, on behalf of all of the commissioners and you, SURF, want to thank our distinguished panel today and the excellent information and expertise they have shared with us, the recommendations that they have made that hopefully we can use as we move forward in trying to be part of the solution and trying to be part of the proactive base in hopefully some way um, as we continue to see because it's proliferating uh, around the world the the use of hate speech and disinformation certainly is growing and expanding not not shrinking and so we will continue to be challenged and we will continue to look uh, to people like each of you, Dr. Banaji, uh, Susan Benish, uh, Waris Hussein, and David Kay, who had to leave us. We will continue to look to people like you as we try to find uh, peaceful solutions uh, moving forward. Thank you so much for your participation to all of our guests out there. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, again, the bios, uh, we're on the chat line, a complete bios of our speakers, but thank you for being with us today and until our next uh, hearing, uh, be safe and be healthy. Bye-bye. <laughs>